name is Wilson Stone. Hello, my viewers, all two of you. It's spooky season again, and what better way to celebrate than watching another boring analysis video? The real horror is that you actually clicked on this video. I mean, don't you guys have better things to do? Well, neither... Neither do I. I hurt myself today. For those of you who can't read, today we'll be looking at the Universal Horror Films collection. Some of the most iconic characters in cinema come from the studio. Dracula, Frankenstein, the Wolfman, all of them have passed into legend, and for good reason. And we're going to be looking at them all today. Since my Christmas Carol videos were, uh, so popular, I figured I'd do the same approach here. Before we begin, I'm not going to be covering all of Universal Horror Films. There's far too many of them, and I really have no desire to talk about stuff like Frankenstein vs. the Wolfman. Yes, this is real. Someone wrote this. So I will only cover the ones that I think are the most noteworthy to discuss. But you may be asking, but the video title says you'll be covering everything. Well, uh, you see, I was using a little advanced technique there called, a uh, line. Without any further ado, let us begin. Nearly 100 years ago. Starting off on our journey is 1923's The Hunchback of Notre Dame, starring Lon Chaney. Kind of an odd place to start, I know, but this is what most people consider to be the first of Universal's horror collection, so I'm gonna go with it. Today, the Victor Hugo novel is probably best remembered by the Disney musical. But this was the first adaptation that had a major impact, and it's not hard to see why. Right off the bat, you can just see the money on screen, but there was not a penny wasted here. From the towering cathedrals to the hundreds of extras, everything about this movie just screams grand. Just knowing that everything we're seeing here is all practical is just amazing. The star of the show here is of course Lon Chaney, and god, what can I say about this guy that hasn't already been said? He's a master of his craft. The way he moves, the way he expresses his face, everything he does is iconic. Unlike some of the most well-known performers, Chaney communicates everything visually. Without the use of any dialogue or title cards, you understand what he's feeling and thinking. That's an accomplishment that very few actors can achieve. Chaney was actually born to deaf parents, so he was naturally much more expressive of his face than others around the time. Unfortunately, he's hardly in the movie. Yeah, it's kind of strange that this starring vehicle for Lon Chaney just has him disappear. The focus has shifted towards the other characters who I really don't care much for. Nothing about them is really all that interesting or memorable to me. Well, besides maybe the poet. Should have just been a poet like I wanted. It's just a bunch of characters that we've seen a hundred times before. You have the dashing hero, the damsel in distress, the comic relief, the bad guy who is conveniently not a priest in this version, so the audience wanted to ask any questions about their own morality. We wouldn't want to do that, no. This is 1923 we're talking about here, folks. Just sunshine, roses, and Calvin Coolidge. Yeah! Though it definitely dragged in some areas, I was thoroughly entertained throughout, and I'm giving this one a 7 out of 10. Next on our journey is The Phantom of the Opera, also starring Lon Chaney. In a way, both this and Hunchback are very similar, having some of the same themes, scenarios, and even some of the same cast members. What sets this movie apart is just how iconic it is. Oh, you might not have seen it, but everyone remembers this classic scene of Eric being unmasked. Everyone remembers this design, and it's for good reason. This is another spectacular performance by Chaney. Even when he's masked, you can still understand what he's thinking. Like his previous role of Quasimodo, the makeup here is just superb. Even under those heavy pounds of plaster, you can still see his large-than-life personality on screen. But like Hunchback of Notre Dame, however, a lot of the same issues plague this production. The other characters just aren't interesting enough to hear the movie by themselves. Whenever they're on screen, you're just waiting for them to get back to Chaney. Now, apparently there is a book that goes further in depth with this, so maybe it's just a problem of adaptation. But god damn, everyone is just a block of wood here. This is a problem that extends to the rest of the film. The first two thirds are just boring. The first portion of this movie takes forever to get going. Establishing the world and environment are all necessary, but it doesn't even do that. It feels like there's something deeper missing here. Almost like there was this whole mythology of the Opera House that was originally there, but now it's nowhere to be found. Thankfully, the film really picks up in its last 30 minutes. I was actually really invested in the rescue attempt, and all the action that happens below in the sewers. The character known as the Persian is really cool. I wish the movie was just about him and not these two idiots. He can command a scene by just standing there and looking cool. Plus, he has that really sweet hat. That's an impeccable hat, sir. Thank you, sir. 
The whole ending portion is a real standout. It's genuinely tense and exciting. But unfortunately, they ruin it with this ridiculous chase scene. Yeah, I'm sorry, but this is just stupid. This guy isn't scary driving a carriage. He looks like a Scooby-Doo villain. I did some digging, and this was apparently a really troubled production. The director, Rupert Julian, and Lon Chaney were never on speaking terms. Phantom had barely begun shooting in mid-October when the clash of two intractable egos occurred. In interviews with Kevin Brownlow, Rudy Belmer, and Richard Kazarski, Ben Anger told the same tale. Quote, it was a terrific strain because Chaney and Julian wouldn't talk to each other. I had to be the messenger boy. Rupert would say, tell Lon to do this, and I'd go over and tell Lon, he wants you to do this. And Lon would say, tell him to go and screw himself. I'll do it the way I want to do it. Now that went on the whole picture. He wouldn't listen to Julian. He did what he wanted. Test audiences apparently didn't like the ending, so it was changed to... Whatever this is. That wouldn't be the last time the film was tampered with either. In 1929, there was actually a sound version released. Yes, a sound version of a silent film. And it's just as weird as it sounds. His eyes are ghastly big, like holes in a grim skull. A few long... The phantom of the opera, revolting, no... They're synchronized opera music, yet title cards to the actors. Some scenes include dialogue, while others don't. Apparently there was something in Shane's contract where his voice couldn't be dubbed or something. So there was an entirely new character created called the Phantom Servant, and he would be the one who would actually speak for him. It was the master who tonight placed the music world of Paris. The master shall lead you farther yet to heights of immortal glory. The version we have today is actually a compilation of takes from both the 1925 and 1929 versions. So is there really an original version? Scott McQueen does a really interesting commentary on this film that I will link in the description, but I've got to say, he's a man with, uh, let's just say a few opinions. Not the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree. It has taken Christine an entire reel to arrive at this brilliant conclusion. Why does Eric have two breathing tubes, unless he is hopeful that Christine will join him for midnight scuba lessons? Notice that Raul and the Persian clearly look down and react in alarm to something. And it ain't Mickey Mouse. Like tablets delivered by Moses down from the mountain, somebody has discovered that you can put the camera in interesting places and that you can actually create cinema with editing. So overall, Vantum is a pretty mixed bag. While it has a good last 30 minutes, you still have to sit through that hour before, which really tanks the movie. So with that said, I'm giving this one a 6 out of 10. In 1927, Universal would release another silent horror film called The Cat and the Canary. Never heard of it? Well, yeah, there's a... there's a reason. Ah! In such an iconic lineup of movies, there was always one bound to be left behind, and it's definitely this one. Now, despite my bitching, it's actually not as bad as I made it out to be. It's just... forgettable. Say what you want about the quality of the others, but you remember the images from them. I can't remember anything from this production. There's nothing that really stands out here. It's just a bunch of tired old horror tropes that were dated even in 1927. There's the old dreary house, the contraptions, the murder mystery. Hell, even Clue does this better. Now despite this, the first 30 minutes of this movie are actually quite good. There was clearly some effort behind this production. The visuals especially are a standout. They got really creative with some of the composition here, which considering the time period is a real accomplishment. There's a great atmosphere that's built up here. It felt like the beginning of the stage play when everyone's making their entrance. It's genuinely really intriguing. Though simplistic, I did like the introduction of all these characters. Everyone has their own defining personalities and traits. Even the guy playing the Persian from the Phantom of the Opera is here, so that's pretty cool. Unfortunately, the movie goes downhill pretty fast, and it gets quite goofy. Hunchback and Phantom had some unintentionally comedic moments, but man, it was nothing like this. <laughs> I guess people seemed to like this one just fine when it came out, because it was actually remade into a sound version a few times, one of which is actually lost. No, I'm not reviewing them, don't ask. Overall, there's nothing inherently bad about it, it's just, uh, kind of meh. I'm going to give this one a 5 out of 10. Moving on. In 1928, Universal will release one last silent horror film before converting the sound, titled The Man Who Laughs. This one has actually started to gain some popularity in recent years, mainly due to... Well, I'm the Joker, baby! <laughs> it was actually really hard finding a copy of this. 
and I may or may not have attained this through more questionable means. Pirates, nay. Privateer. It took forever, but I was finally able to watch it. And despite there being a 30 second ad every 5 minutes, I finally got through it. And... It's alright. Going into this, I had no idea this was going to be a period piece, so that came up as quite a bit of a shock to me. It's certainly a very unique setting, and has plenty of 20s anachronisms. The story is surprisingly kind of complicated for a silent film. It follows Gwynplaine, who's the son of some rebel leader who used to be a lord or something. I'm sure it's better explained in the book, but we don't read things here. This is Mermerica, goddammit! Oh they punish his son by carving a smile into his face and leaving him the fan for himself. He joins a circus and falls in love with a blind girl. And meanwhile, the simp lord, who was a jester but somehow rose to being a duke, is trying to track him down and not kill him, but make him a lord too. And there's all this political discourse, and there's a duchess, and uh... Yeah, it's a bit of a mess. Despite the story being overly convoluted, there's some notable stuff that stands out. The performance of Conrad Veidt is actually really good. He's no Lon Chaney, but he still manages to hold his own. Veidt was certainly no stranger to playing creepy characters, such as Caesar in The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. The other actors do a decent job as well. I do like the little community that develops around him in the circus. It's a nice change of pace from the classic, Oh no, he's a monster! No, people actually seem to love him. I like how they all come together at the end to help him out. It's better than the angry mob trope, which we've seen so many times in these movies. I was strangely entertained by the villain. He's so fucking pathetic, it's hilarious. He tries to be all intimidating, but he's so much of a ham, you can't take him seriously. This guy gets taken out by a dog. Yeah, that's how scary this guy is. The dog is also named Homo, which just tickled my inner 12-year-old's funny bone. I like the contrast of the circus and the political scenes in the palace. The real circus are these guys. Wow, meta, dude! That's the theme of the movie. He said the theme of the movie. Unfortunately, the movie really drags in the middle, and I mean really drags. There's a significant portion where not a lot happens, and it really brings down the narrative. Though not being very long, I feel like I could have benefited with 10 minutes being removed. It might make the pacing quicker. As it is, though, it's... fine. It was decent enough, but I'll probably never watch it again. Overall, a 5 out of 10. Next up on our list is, oh, wait, silly me, we're dividing this into parts. You know, we felt that from the very beginning, the Universal Horror series needed to be three parts. It gives us more opportunity for more view, I mean, more opportunities to discuss further in depth for these films. And the next episode will be interesting. Um. Until then, I'm going back for a three month slumber. See you around, kiddos.